My name is uh, Jenny Rhodes. I work for the University of Maryland Extension. I am the, or the county ag agent or extension educator. I work with agriculture and uh, natural resources. So I want to wel welcome you to our seventh annual organic um, grain forage. And last year we added vegetable production uh, to our workshop. I want to thank a couple people. It's certainly in partnership. I can't certainly do this alone. We work with uh, the USDA Beltsville Agriculture Research Center, the University of Maryland, who I work with. The Maryland Department um, of Agriculture, Karen Feeder, works with that. The Natural Resource Conservation Service, and certainly Chesapeake College. We're very lucky to have this wonderful facility here. I also want to thank uh, Luke Howard. He's here. Tell him thank you seven years ago. He was instrumental in uh, working and with Jeff Moyer, who you're going to hear this morning, and getting this whole uh, conference going. So we've been very lucky that we've been able to sustain uh, this conference. Grant money uh, works very well. A lot of that has come from the uh, Beltsville Agricultural Research Center with uh, Michelle Cavagilli. So we all work together, and I'm very happy. Um, we have a very good program for you today, so please enjoy yourself. Make sure you got signed in uh, out in the lobby. There's nutrient management credits for anybody from Maryland. Also, certify, um, CCA if you're a certified crop advisor uh, credits. And also, make sure you put down your email. I have an organic listserv that I try to send out if there's something going on. So I, my job is outreach education, so anytime I can send anything out, I certainly uh, try to do that. We do have a upcoming uh, workshop I thought you might be interested in. It's, it's called the Producer's Digital Toolbox, Coming Your Way. You know, with all the uh, new things, uh, media, social media, they're going to cover social media. They're going to work on registering your forms on national listservs such as Google, MapQuest, Bing, some other things. They're going to do some work uh, with smartphone, with apps, commodity prices, credit card purchases, weather, GPS, and more. There is a handout on the table when you came in. It's going to be across the state on April 10th. It's going to be at Warwick Community College. The 20th, it'll be here at Chesapeake. May 10th, it'll be at Hagerstown. And May 15th, it'll be at Cecil County. So that should be an excellent, excellent workshop uh, to attend. I want to talk just a few minutes. You'll see a display out uh, in the lobby on e-extension. Uh, Extension is working and collaborating uh, with other scientists and research-based uh, information schools. So it's just eExtension.org. Uh, it's got a lot of information and it certainly has a lot on organics. Let's see if I can get down here. There is a link right on the front page that takes to uh, webinars on e organics. They have, they have a newsletter you can sign up for. Once you sign up for the newsletter, you'll get emails about when the webinars are occurring. I believe there's one happening today, and you can see uh, on down there's, there's a lot going on. So some really great information from all across the nation. So I urge you certainly to take a look at that. I think that's enough on um, housekeeping. So certainly organic farming is one of the fastest growing sectors in U.S. agriculture over this last decade. Uh, the United States has um, just under a million acres of certified organic farmland, uh, you know, when Congress passed the Organic Food Production um, Act in 1990. And just a little bit about some background since we are talking about uh, organic crop uh, production. Overall, certified organic cropland and pasture accounted for about 0.6 percent of U.S. farmland in 2008. 0.2% was corn, 0.2% soybeans, and 0.7% um, was, was uh, wheat. That's certainly organic um, vegetable production, 13% of organic carrots, 8% uh, when you look at lettuce, and 5% with apples. So you can see the vegetable production is a little ahead. And then 2.7% uh, in dairy. So as we can see, uh, Organic is certainly growing, and so that's why we're here today to learn and bring you some research-based uh, information. I'm excited to have uh, Jeff Moyer. Jeff Moyer works for the Rodale Institute. He is their farm director. He was instrumental in helping us uh, get started with our uh, first organic meeting. I think he's been to every one, maybe except for one. So we really appreciate Rodale's um, 
help with this. So Jeff uh, is an expert in organic crop production systems, uh, including weed management, cover crops, crop rotation, equipment modification and use, and facilities design. He has helped countless farmers make the transition from conventional chemical-based farming to organic or sustainable methods. Throughout his more than 30 years with Rodale Institute, Jeff has brought a farmer's perspective to the approach of, of issues in organic agriculture. And I really think that is one of the most uh, important things to have that certainly farmer's um, approach. Um, he is a past chair of the National Organic Standards Board, uh, which assists the USDA Secretary of Agriculture in developing standards for materials to be used in organic production as as well as advising on other aspects of implementing the National Organics Program. He's also a founding board member of the Pennsylvania uh, Orga Certified Organics. So I could go on and on, but that's just a few things. So let's welcome Jeff. Thanks for coming, Jeff. What an exciting time to be involved with agriculture. At no time in the history of American food production have we been able to muck up the system as badly as we are today and make millions of dollars while we're doing it. You know, I have a friend who farms about 3,000 acres of conventional corn, and he said last year, I made so much money, I don't know what to do with it. He bought a new tractor and a corn planter, paid a half a million dollars for it. He said, I, I tried to buy another farm. He offered the guy six million dollars for it. He's got money to spend. And look what we're doing to our environment while we're doing that. We have, indeed, a broken food system. USDA statistics show that in Iowa, for every bushel of corn we produce, on average, not every farm, on average, and a bushel of corn weighs, what, 56 pounds? We lose 44 pounds of topsoil. And that is sustainable agriculture. Or we have a broken food system. Look what we're doing to our well water. Now that doesn't show Maryland, but Maryland could be on the map. It's not quite as bad as the Midwest. Our soils are a little bit more forgiving uh, and our wells maybe a little deeper. Uh, the water will get there eventually, I mean the atrazine, and then we get to drink it. Here is Iowa. I tell everybody, if you want to buy Iowa farmland, you should head off to the Gulf of Mexico because that's where it is. And that's where it's going. In fact, in 2008, and again it happened in 2011, uh, over 2 million acres of Iowa lost 20 tons of topsoil per acre while they're making millions of dollars. Does this system make sense to anybody? Back in 1942, J.I. Rodale put a couple of words on a piece of paper. And the words said, healthy soil, healthy food, healthy people. Our goal as farmers, your goal as farmers, is not to produce crops. That's not your goal. That's, my, that's what you do, that's part of the work that you, that you uh, set out to achieve, but that's not your goal. Your goal is to produce healthy people. G.I. Rodale said it in 1942. The goal, the ultimate goal is to produce healthy people. Now if that's the goal of agriculture, we are failing miserably. We do not have healthy people. Statistics say that uh, within the next 20 years, uh, diabetes is going to chew up our entire national health care budget. There will be no money for anything else. It could take all the dollars that we have just for that one disease. I'm pretty old. I'm 56. When I was in grade school, we had one or two kids that we used to tease, probably, because they were a little overweight. Today, over 50% of the kids in school are overweight. You know why we have a school lunch program? People know why we have that? Because during World War II, when young men were being uh, drafted into the military, too many of them were malnourished and underweight. They did not meet the health category st st standards that the military had 
for induction into service. So they said, well, we gotta feed these kids in school, so we got a school lunch program so we could take care of kids. Now, over half the young men or women that try to get into the service today can't get in because they're obese. They're over, they're on the other end of the spectrum, over the, the weight chart. Why is that? Why is that happening? Well, it's, it's not that suddenly <clears throat> kids want to eat more than they did in the 50s, 60s, or 70s. It's because we're eating lots and lots of empty calories. So while we're destroying our resource, forget about what G.I. Rodale said about healthy soil, we're not taking care of that either. But while we're destroying the resource base, we're producing food crops that are devoid of nutrients. <coughs> Here's a statistic uh, that's kind of shocking. This was on CNN, uh, April 12th, 2011, a little over a year ago. I went on to CNN's website and just took a screenshot of this. Look at what those numbers say about young women in our country. In the 1800s, the average age a girl entered puberty was 18. Today, it is 11. It's the food we eat. It's the way we farm is changing our very genetic makeup. In fact, they said, I saw a statistic later, I wasn't able to, to print anything out, but if you take that 11% and you break it down between urban and rural kids, urban girls, it is seven. Seven. That should scare the tar out of all of us. Oh, and while we're doing all this, you know, we, we constantly talk about the need to feed the world. How many people have heard that our job as American farmers is to feed the world? I hear it all the time. We waste over half the food we produce in this country. 50% of the food that we produce ends up in, in landfills. In developing countries, it's closer to 70% because they don't have good storage capacity. So when we talk about the amount of work that goes into producing food and, and trying to feed the world, we're certainly not doing it. And when you think about sustainability, we're just, we're just trying to paint some of the problems here. You know, I, you know, I think there's a lot of problems that we can look at. We'll, we'll try to brighten this picture up a little bit as we go along. But if you look at something as, as simple as phosphorus fertilizer, the phosphorus fertilizer industry says, this is their own information, they said that we'll be lucky to have enough phosphorus fertilizer at current use, if we don't expand use, at current use to last 100 years. When I talked to the folks at the Aurora Mine in North Carolina and asked them about that, and I said, well, what do you, what's the plan? They said, well, I won't live 100 years, so that's my plan. Uh, well, that's a good plan for individuals. It's not a good plan for agriculture as a whole. So in many cases, we're sticking our head in the sand and ignoring the problems. Now, I don't expect you to read all of this but just wanted to throw up something to talk about a little bit about GMOs and the right to know laws. Uh, there was a law, uh, or a bill in Congress that uh, House Bill uh, 3553 that is trying to get, trying to get folks that produce processed products to label GMO food. That is gonna be a tough, tough sell. And why is that? Well, it's because people, in general, don't want it. You know, there's a couple of ways you can market things. One is you can ask people what they want, and then you can produce it and sell it to them. The other is to produce something that you want and then try to convince people that they can't live without it and that they need it. That's what we're doing in agriculture today. We're producing products that people do not want. It's not healthy for them. We're ruining the resource that we're using to do it. And we're pushing it on them and marketing on them uh, in ways that are really uh, uns unscrupulous. This, was just, uh, this just came out in the news media on January 18th of this year, and it says that BASF is pulling out of the GM market in Europe. Why? Because people won't buy it, and they're trying to be tired of beating their head on that rock. They're just going to do away with it and say, look, we're just not even going to try to market that in, in Europe anymore. When is America going to wake up and take the same uh, path? I don't know. I don't expect you to read this chart over here, but even if you could read it, I would dare say that very few people in this room could pronounce those words anyway. <clears throat> 100 years ago, when you'd bake a cake or make a loaf of bread, there were four ingredients. Whole grain flour, water, yeast, and salt. In that fudge cake, there's 113 ingredients, most of which are chemicals that you can't pronounce or, or, 
or even know what they do in there. The people who bake the cake don't know what they do in there. But that's what we're being fed. So when we're being fed these kinds of foods, it's no wonder that we are in a situation where we're getting obese. And it's not just because it's fudge cake. And then, oh, here's, here's, you know, here's another good one, uh, ethanol. Another problem that we have in our, in our food production world, ethanol. Since 1980, uh, estimates are that uh, farmers have received $45 billion through the ethanol uh, subsidy programs. Uh, that's federal dollars. $45 billion. Just think what we as organic farmers could have done with $45 billion of research money. We typically get the scraps from the table, very few dollars for the kinds of research that Rodale does and many of the folks that are represented in this room here, whether it's uh, land grant universities or USDA. Very few research dollars, very little money compared to the kinds of money that go into some of these other programs. I was visiting with a friend of mine uh, a couple of years ago actually now and we were trying to get some, some corn from him that was GMO corn because we didn't have any from our own site. We were doing a feeding study with the uh, University of Wisconsin. And I said, well, we need some corn. He said, well, what, can we get some? And he said, well, sure, I'll give you corn. What do you want it for? And I told him about this feeding study. And he said, oh, I can save you all the time and money. You don't have to do the study. I'll tell you right now, your corn's better than mine. I said, oh, why do you say that? He said, well, he said, my grandfather kept very meticulous records on his beef operation. And he said, I have to feed 20% more grain today than he did when he was feeding his beef animals to get the same daily rate of gain. So he said, my corn is not nutritious. But he went on to say, the fact of the matter is, I don't get rewarded for nutrition. I'm not paid to produce highly nutritious corn. I'm paid to produce as many tons of yellow stuff as I possibly can at the cheapest price I can do it so I can make a living. And as long as that's what we reward farmers to do, this is what we'll get. In fact, he said, I don't even know if it's going to be ethanol. I don't know if it's going to be a printer zinc from my soybean. I don't know what it's going to be. It could be rot oil. I don't, you know, I don't grow food. I grow thousands of acres of yellow stuff. So as long as we keep thinking of, of things like that and rewarding farmers for that kind of practice, that's what we're going to get. J.I. Understood, J.I. Rodale understood in 1942 that it's all about the soil. But we've known for a long time. Zeophon here, 400 years before the birth of Christ, said to be a successful farmer, one must first know the nature of soil. How many farmers in this room really think that they have a good handle on understanding the properties of their soil? I'm actually going to ask for some hands. No, no. I, got, I see, I, I saw two. I don't believe them. <laughs> it is very complex. It is very difficult. It is not easy to understand the nature of soil. But if we don't work at it and don't try and don't try to understand it, how can we possibly produce healthy people? Again, that's our goal. Our goal isn't to grow crops. Your goal is not to grow crops. It is to produce healthy people. You're going to use crops to do it, but you've got to manage the soil on the other end in order to get the healthy food to have healthy people. So it's really all about the soil. Everything you do on your farm, you should be asking yourself, how does this impact my soil? How is this going to make my soil better than it was? And why is that important? Well, going back to this idea of feeding the world, the system we have in place today to produce food would be great if we had to feed people for, say, 30 years, 15 years. I don't know. Perfect system. Plenty of phosphorus fertilizer, plenty of soil in Iowa, plenty of everything, plenty of chemicals. Uh, we can do it. And if you're obese, you're not going to live that long anyway, but 30 years would be perfect. But that's not the case. We need to feed people for thousands of years. On our farm in Pennsylvania, we had Native American people living on our farm, and we know that because of the uh, anthrop anthropology and archaeology departments from Kutztown University that did studies there. And they're saying 8,000 years ago, there were people on our farm managing the landscape, albeit using stone tools and fire, very rudimentary farming practices. But they were farming on that soil 8,000 years ago. Today, we use tractors. What is farming going to look like on our land 8,000 years from now? 
I have no idea. You have no idea. If you do, you know, then we should talk about lottery numbers maybe. Uh, we don't have any idea what that's going to look like, but we do know, what we do know is that 8,000 years ago they needed the soil. Today we need the soil, and 8,000 years from now they're going to need the soil. And if we don't take care of it, if we don't manage it differently than we are today, as a system, you know, I know you guys are either organic farmers or heading in that direction, and that's, that's where we need to go. But if you look at our food production system, you heard Jenny say 3% uh, or 4% of, of the farmland out there is, is being farmed organically, and that's going to change. We know we need the soil. What are we going to do today to improve that soil? How are we going to farm your land so that when you turn it over to your children or grandchildren, it's in better shape than it was when you got it? That needs to be part of your goal. Because if you do that right, by default, you're going to produce healthy food. By default, you're going to have good crops. And by default, we're going to have healthy people. It can't help but work in that, in that vein. Well, I think what this means is we have to start asking, asking different questions, asking the right questions. What are your goals? What are your goals for your farm? What resources do you have available to you? Are you using them to the best of your ability to actually produce what it is you, you want to grow? What kind of a food system do we want as a society? We have choices here. All of us have choices. And while we sit back and don't exercise those choices, other people, companies, corporations, are making those choices for us. But we certainly want to keep people healthy. We think we need to, at Rodale, we think we need to elevate farmers to the status of doctors. Doctors should be the last place you go when you get sick. You know, if you, uh, I have some, some friends that I've worked with in China, and they said, well, in China it's completely different. They said, you pay the doctor to keep you healthy. And you go to the doctor on a routine basis, just like you might have the veterinarian come to your farm. You pay the doctor to keep you healthy. And if you get sick, he has to give you money back. Because he or she failed their job. Wow. Talk about uh, Obamacare. I mean, that's a, really a different slant on things. Try to get that one passed. That would be tough. But if we think about it, that's really what doctors should be doing. That's what farmers should be doing, is keeping people healthy. The sign out there on one of the, one of the tables. Do you know your farmer or know your farmer? Kathleen Merrigan at the USDA says, at every talk that I hear her talk about, she says, know your farmer. You don't know who's putting food in your, in your, your mouth and in your stomach. Most of us don't know who that is. I just had dinner last night at a restaurant here. It was a good meal. I know nothing about the fisherman who caught the fish, the rice grower that grew the rice, the salad mix. I have no idea where it came from. I don't know that farmer. And we're eating it. We're putting, taking it into our bodies. We really need to spend more time learning who our farmers are, what they're doing, and how they're doing it. But if we ask the right questions, we can begin to discover that there are other ways of producing food that don't rely on chemical inputs. Successful ways. <clears throat> I was privileged to be in California a few years ago, and I stood in the middle of the road uh, looking to the east or the west. I don't know which way I was looking uh, for each of these photographs, but I took one picture, turned 180 degrees, took the other picture. Raisin grapes. Picture on, I'm dyslexic, your left. Conventional raisin grapes. The other side, organic raisin grapes. Same resources. Same labor, same crop, same trellis system. Everything is exactly the same except the way the farmer is choosing to use those resources. When I was there, uh, I was in the middle of the um, monarch migratory butterfly flights. Now, you're a migratory butterfly. Which side of the road are you going to go to? Which side of the road do you want to live on? Which side of the road do you think the beneficial insects will be, the birds, the soil microorganisms? Where's, where's life expanding and growing? On that side of the road, why are we farming like this? I don't know. I can't explain it. It works in Pennsylvania, too. It'll work on your farm. This is our farm in 1970. That was a photograph that was used by the real estate company to market the farm. A little hard to see in that small picture, but lots of erosion ditches through the farm. The main line, I don't have a pointer, but the main line that runs from the building sort of up to the, to the right-hand corner there 
that was at one time a road. It had turned into an erosion ditch. There was a bridge at the bottom of the hill and a bridge at the top of the hill to get from one side of the farm to the other because the erosion ditch was too deep to cross any more with tractors. That's our farm in 2000. Now, when we did that transformation, we didn't do it by, I mean, I wish, wish we could have. You know, Bob Rodale didn't come to me and say, oh, here's a few million dollars, make my farm look like this. He said, here's a farm, make it profitable, and make it better than it was when I bought it. Improve the soil. So there it is in 2000. Uh, we divided that farm up into 132 fields. It's a 330-acre farm. Every field had to produce a marketable crop every year. I mean, that's my challenge as farm manager, farm director. I have a budget. I got to sell crops. So yes, I have to grow crops, but that's not my goal. My goal is to produce healthy people, and I do that by managing the soil. But yes, I have to grow crops. There's a pointer for you. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Thank you. Wish I got treated like this at home. <laughs> this right here, this is the road that's an erosion ditch. There's a bridge here and a bridge right there. Look, the systems we're talking about today, uh, this is conventional agriculture. It's based on chemistry and biotechnology. Two legitimate sciences. No question about it. And we've proven that we can produce food in large quantities really cheap with this kind of a system. But biology is a legitimate science too. And what we're talking about with organic agriculture isn't smoke and mirrors, it's not voodoo, it's not based on snake oil. You can buy all those things. I'm not saying you can't. But the system of production is based on biology, which is a legitimate science, just like any other science. You can maybe come to this school and take classes in biology. We're not talking about something that is, uh, is not real. We can change the way we farm. We can change the way we produce food. We can have the abundance. Those organic raisin grapes produce just as many grapes or raisins as the grapes on the conventional side, just as many while it was improving the resource that did it. We can have our cake and eat it too. That is the beauty of the system. Look, pointing out problems is all well and good, and we can all sit and do that all day long. But unless we have solutions to those problems, there's really no point in that. It's just a, it's just a game. We have solutions to these problems, solutions that we can put to work on our farms today. We don't have all the answers to all the problems. Clearly, that's true. But we do have tools that we can use. I've spent a good part of my life working on organic weed management. All of us have weeds. If, if you're farming, you have weeds. I, I think of a Mennonite farmer that, was, uh, that lives used to live next door to us at Rodale. He passed away. And he said when his father died, he said, I went to see him. And he was laying in, the, you know, in, the, in his bed and not doing well. And he said, my father called me over and he said, Ben. He said, remember that farm we used to have along the Susquehanna River when you were growing up? Yeah, Dad, he said, I remember that. He said, remember how I used to make you and your brother go out and pull thistles all day long? Oh, yeah, he said, I remember those thistles. You know what, he said? It didn't do a damn bit of good. Those thistles were still there when he left the farm. They bothered him to the day he died. We all have weeds. I've spent a lot of time trying to manage weeds, but also trying to manage tillage. So when farmers, conventional farmers say, oh, well, we do organic no till, uh, we do conventional no-till, so that makes us good. Well, it might make you better in terms of soil erosion, that's true. But generally speaking, if you look at uh, reduced tillage in conventional systems, it grew up hand in glove with an expansion of the chemical industry. We have Roundup, we have 2,4-D, we have all these things that we can put into a chemical soup, spray on the soil, and stop the weeds from growing or kill them, and then we can go in and insert our crops. Well, how do we take advantage of those systems in organic farming? That was the challenge that I posed to myself. How are we going to do that? How can we reduce tillage? So on our farm, what I started to do was I started to move away from a moldboard plow to a chisel plow. And then I went from a chisel plow to just a heavy disc. And then I went from a heavy disc to actually trying some no-till with no, no tillage at all. And it was an abysmal failure. Well, it stands to reason. I mean, conventional guys were expanding their use of chemistry. I was expanding my use of nothing. So I was hoping for the best and getting the worst. And I was seeing my weed populations go out of sight. And you know, I'm, a, I'm a slow learner. I did that for a while. And then you know, I sort of looked at our garden. You look at a garden, 
We learned in our gardens a long time ago that we can mulch out annual weeds. Ah, there's biology at work. It's not that the weeds aren't there. It's not that the weed seeds aren't in the soil. They're just not expressing themselves because they're not exposed to sunlight. Okay, now there's a nugget of information that we can use and put to work on, on our farms on a bigger scale, except for the fact that carting mulch out to a 100-acre cornfield is not going to be a lot of fun. So how do we do it? Well, we're going to have to grow the mulch right in the field. But we can do that. And once we do that, we can take advantage of all the modern equipment that we use for planting no-till in conventional agriculture, whether it's a grain dill, a corn plant, or a transplanter, it doesn't matter what it is. Ag engineering has solved a lot of those problems. When I talked to John Deere, the folks out in, uh, in, uh, in the center part of the country, you know, they said, uh, you know, if you can drive a tractor through it, we can plant in it. That's how, how confident they are with their planting equipment, and rightly so, and they can. And we can. So when we talk about organic farming, we're not talking about going backwards to what grandpa used to do or great grandpa. Yes, there were some nuggets of information that we need to go back and capture and pull forward, but we're talking about modern agriculture. So when, when Jenny says that we're at about 4% of, of production, or maybe even a little less than that, in acreage, that's true. But it is growing fast partly because consumers are demanding it, consumers are recognizing the importance of supporting agricultural systems that produce food that will keep them healthy. And partly it's because farmers are capturing this kind of information saying, hey, we can do this. This is modern agriculture, this is the way of the future, and we want to get on board early. Again, trying to put a face of science on this, uh, we have a farming systems trial at our, at our institution that has just, in 2011, uh, passed the 30-year mark. So we've been, I tell everybody it started as a five-year experiment, but we can't count too well, so we're still doing it 30 years later. But we have this side-by-side -side comparison of organic and conventional tillage, and it started in 1981, and it really started as a project to document the feasibility of transitioning to organic from a conventional system. So when we first started on this piece of land, we, we rented the land, we didn't own it. And we transitioned it from conventional continuous corn, it had been in corn for 25 years, to an organic system, and we did it scientifically. So we broke it up into three different replications, I'm sorry, eight re replications, and three different farming systems. And what did we find out after 30 years? Well, it's pretty exciting stuff. First, we found out that we can match the yields of conventional agriculture. Not in every year. There are some years when conventional beets are organic, and that's okay, because we're not just farming for one year, and we're not just feeding people for one year. We're feeding people for generations. So when you look at the system over time, uh, the yields are exactly comparable. In fact, in stress years, like droughts, so when, the, when it's too wet or too dry, the organic systems actually outperform the conventional systems. When have we had a normal year? What's happening to weather patterns? They're shifting and changing. We can drought-proof our soils. We can change the way the soil and our crops respond to the climate and the environment simply by changing the way we farm. We can sequester more carbon. We can build organic matter in our soil. Our soils and our farm, when I took over, were somewhere around 1.5% of organic matter. Today, they're closer to 5 anywhere from, from four and a half to six, it really varies a little bit. But we know we're improving our soil, and while we're doing it, we're producing crops. So it's not like you have to have one or take one without the other. Organic systems produce less greenhouse gas, so we're emitting less gas, and we're capturing more carbon, so we're no, no longer part of the problem, we're part of the solution. That's what we want to be. We want our farms to be part of the solution. We use less energy, what do we talk about in the newspaper every day? What are we, you know, gas prices are going up, oil, uh, diesel prices are going up. We can use less energy on our farms and still produce, you see, we're still producing as much, if not more, crops using less energy. And oh, by the way, because consumers are supporting our work, we have greater net returns. That greater net returns was, was substantiated in the most recent USDA uh, and the, the NAS data that came out when they talked about organic farms are more profitable than conventional farms. So we can make more money, produce more crops, use less energy to do it, sequester more carbon. Why aren't we doing it? Big questions. 
Dr. Ray Weil, University of Maryland, those are his hands over there holding those two different soils. Uh, those soils came from a field in our farming systems trial five feet apart from each other. So they're right next door to each other. You can see the difference in the color. When you bring kindergarten kids out, they can identify lots of differences. They can see more, more earthworms. They can see more uh, uh, macro life, more roots. Look what happens when you put those same two hands full of soil in an aquarium full of water. Why is Iowa ending up in the Gulf of Mexico? Think of that earlier slide. Because we have ruined Iowa's soils. We change the way the soil responds to rain. So what we're saying is, we can farm Iowa, we can grow corn and soybeans. We just have to change the way we do it, and we can not only protect the soil, but we can improve it, because the soil that stayed in a lump in that aquarium is not gonna wash away, but the other one will. Same soils, just change the way we farm them. Can have a huge impact. Remember, it's all about the soil. Zeophon told us that. It's all about the soil. And of course, crops respond to the soil that they're growing in. Now the difference in that soil is somewhere around 2% organic matter on the right, 5% on the left. That's the only difference. Corn, planted at roughly the same time. The organic corn was actually planted a little bit later. The organic corn is the taller, greener one. It didn't rain more in that little plot. The soil just held the moisture. You look at crop insurance, uh, John Hall's here, crop insurance. What do we pay crop insurance on? Drought. Number one reason that we pay off crop insurance. We can drought proof our soils. Wouldn't we be better off as a society to pay farmers to change the way they farm, to create more organic farms? If we have to pay them, let's pay them to do that than rather than give them crop insurance for nothing. We'd get the crop and better soil and it wouldn't cost us any more. There's different ways to look at things. I just put this up here to, to talk a little bit about carbon. I don't want to get into a deep carbon discussion. And we can argue why carbon is in the air. We know that there's more carbon in the air. We can't dispute that. Uh, is it natural? I don't know. Is it man-made? I don't know. It doesn't really matter. It's there. What are we going to do about it? Well, we can do what the USDA does, which is change the hardiness zone map and say the world's all good. We just change the map. Eventually, Pennsylvania will be like Georgia. Well, could be. Or we can change the way we farm so we can sequester more of that carbon out of the air. If we would change, instead of having 4% of the land being farmed organically, if we had 94% being farmed organically, think of all the carbon we could sequester. We're going to use less energy to do it at the same time. These are the kind of things we need to start thinking about on, on, on our individual farms. A little bit of scientist in me, I can't help but show a little bit of data. I don't want to get buried in data, but just to show you that there is data that supports our conclusions, we're not just making this stuff up. This is real hard science. And what we're seeing is that over time, oh, we're actually sequestering more carbon in our soils. If you talk to somebody like uh, Rattan Lal at Iowa State University, he will tell you that with organic, I'm sorry, with conventional no-till systems, which he works with a lot, the very best you can hope to do on a conventional farm is, is kind of break even and hold your own. And we're sort of pretty much doing that on our conventional systems in our farming systems trial. We're pretty much holding our own. We're not losing carbon. And that's because we're managing that as tightly as we can. Most farms are not doing that. Greenhouse gas, just to show you that we have a lot of data showing that our greenhouse gas emissions on the organic system are much less than on, conventional, than on the conventional side. We're using less energy. Energy is being used in, in different ways. You know, it takes a lot of energy to make fertilizer. I don't know if people saw this. This was in the newspaper in the New York Times in January of 2009, so it's, it's a couple years old now. PepsiCo, they own Tropicana orange juice. What they wanted to do was, PepsiCo wanted to look at what their carbon footprint was for having orange juice on every breakfast table across America or around the world or wherever they ship it. I had some orange juice here this morning. What's the carbon footprint of that? What's it going to do? How can we green up PepsiCo? How can we green up Tropicana? What can we change? And they suspected, when you read the article, they suspected that it was going to be you know, transportation packaging. What were they going to do to change the packaging? How were they going to ship it different? You know, should they put it on airplanes? What should they do to make that carbon footprint less? You know what they found out? 58% of their carbon footprint was in nitrogen fertilizer to grow the oranges. 
78% of the air we breathe is nitrogen. You can get it for free. You just you have to plant cover crops under the orange trees that are legumes, and they'll grab the nitrogen out of the air, put it in the roots for the orange trees, and you can do it all without that. So when you look at distribution, uh, you know, that's 22%. Well, you still have to ship it. So you can't cut that out completely. Well, you could, but then you're going to bury yourself in orange juice, and you won't be profitable. Packaging is, 3%, is 15%. Use and disposal, 3%. It's all in the production. And we can change that. So we have the tools. We can go to PepsiCo today. Right now, we could, if they were in the hallway, go out and talk to them and say, I can save you 58% of your carbon footprint. Boom. How can you do that? Well, change your fertilizer. That's a no-brainer. And some economic data. And again, this data is substantiated by the USDA's NAS work as well in their, in their most recent survey when they talk to organic farmers and conventional farmers. Organic farms are more profitable. These sorts of indices point us in the direction of success. We, we, can, we can change the way we farm. We have a broken food system. If we change the way we farm, we can have a successful food system. Not perfect. No system is going to be perfect. But we need to start working in that direction. So when you look at the, uh, the conventional industry, the Monsantos of the world, and you wonder why are they fighting organic agriculture? 3% of market share? If you, I don't care what business you're in, if you had 90% of market share, or 97% of market share, you would not be worried about that other 3%, especially if it's scattered and dispersed around the country in, in a bunch of little different farms and little food processing operations. You wouldn't even be concerned with that gnat. Unless, unless you knew that they were right. And the tipping point for changing agriculture production isn't 50%. People say, oh, once we get to 51%, no, no, no. Statisticians tell us it's somewhere around 11, 11 to 13%. Once you get to that point, the whole system starts to turn and flip. And it changes rapidly from that point on. So yes, it's slow growth between 1942 or 1938, whenever J.R. Rodale started linking the words organic and agriculture together in one sentence. Slow growth from then till now but it's growing rapidly, it grows geometrically, it's changing. You folks are on the right side of the table. When things flip, you're gonna be on the green side of the road, not the brown side of the road, because you're already moving in the right direction. You are having a positive impact on the environment, a positive impact on people's health, and it's important that you understand how vital the work that you do is to all of us in our society. And it's not just Rodale. University of Illinois, uh, Conan and Mulvaney Ellsworth, doing some work on the moral plots there. What they were doing is looking at nitrogen use. On the, these are long-term project plots that are over 100 years old. Kind of interesting, when you read the last sentence, it says, the use of yield-based systems for fertilizer nitrogen management were advocated for the sake of short-term economic gain rather than long-term stability. We cannot sustain the system we have for long term. We can sustain it long enough so that certain people are going to make millions of dollars, yes. But we cannot sustain it forever. And they went on to say, and this is a little bit unusual, those of us who, who write some scientific papers, a little unusual for us to draw conclusions in a research paper that is published using words like overwhelming. The evidence is overwhelming. Generally, people write papers that say, uh, there's a, the, the evidence indicates something, or the trend looks like it's going in this direction. They said there's overwhelming evidence. There's no question. And then they go on to say that our, our input-intensive cereal production system is seriously flawed. Seriously flawed. They didn't just say flawed. They didn't say, looks like there might be some flaws here. It is seriously flawed. And we agree. On a global perspective, the United Nations did a study back in 2010 looking at this whole question of feeding the world. We've got to feed the world. We've got to do that. How are we going to do that? Well, part of the problem, I mean, part of the solution is getting people to feed themselves, of course. So when they look at a global picture, they looked at every kind of food production system that's out there in the world, they came to the conclusion that in developing countries, organic agricultural systems achieve equal or higher yields. So when we look at the international world, our goal isn't to ship more chemicals and more GMOs to people who can't afford them and don't want them. 
is to change the way we farm, change the way we look at the soil. Let's face it, we all vote with our dollars. There's gonna be food here today. Somebody voted with their dollars and picked a particular type of food. I don't know where it is, I don't know where it came from. We all vote, whether you go to a restaurant, supermarket, in your garden, however you get your food, we vote with our dollars. If we want high fructose corn syrup, uh, Twinkies, and whatever else that woman's picking up off the grocery store shelves, at least let's say this is a conscious decision. Yes, I want the cheapest food I can possibly get, and I don't care if we destroy the resource to get it. Let's say that. But what so many people say is, oh, I don't want to see that side of the fence. I don't want to see that picture. I don't want to see the brown side of the road. I only want to see the green side. You know, farms are no longer the picture that most people have of them when you walk down a street in any town you want and you ask them to describe a farm and they still have Pa driving the tractor and mom's out there feeding chickens out of her apron, you know, and we're, we're, we're picking some vegetables and the kids are getting on the school bus. That's not how life is on the farm anymore. We need to change that. And we can change it, and it is changing, and people are supporting it. And again, the vitalness of the work that you do can't be underestimated. You're the key link in the success of this whole operation. Today you're going to have the opportunity to hear from researchers and farmers about lots of great work so that you can grab those tools, take them home, put them to work on your farm to improve your own situation. I challenge you to get as much out of this kind of meeting as you possibly can. There's meetings like this around the country that I'm pri privileged to go to and there is a wealth of information out there. There are people who are far brighter than me working day and night to try to give you the tools that you need to make your farm successful. And if we demand organic, if we work together, we can be successful. Thank you for your time. Did you want to take time to have any questions? Yeah, we have some a few minutes if you, before the next speaker. If, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. No questions? Go ahead. Jeff, thank you very much. I, I do have a question. I, I'm having a problem, um, and, it, and it refers to uh, GMOs. Uh, my background is agronomy. I'm a student at Ray Wilder University of Maryland, way, way, way back. And um, I think you just said Ray's really old, right? No, I was, I'm old. <laughs> but, um, you know, Robert Rodale's book, uh, Save Three Lives. Yes. Um, he, he talks about. Um, lost crops in Africa. He talks about? The lost crops in Africa. Yes. And certain grains and certain other crops which were used many, many years ago, which are not used that much today, but need some kind of tinkering with. Could biotechnology be used to help fix some of those crops, or should traditional breeding be used to help fix some of those crops for feeding Sub-Saharan Africa? Okay, the question was, if I understand it correctly, is that, um, based, it talks about GMO issues. Robert Rodell wrote a book called Saving Three Lives, and he talked about lost grain crops. Amaranth is one, quinoa, different crops that are out there in the world that uh, indigenous people had used in the past, but are no longer either part of their culture or at least not used in any great quantity. And could GMO or could genetic modification or biotechnology be used to improve those crops and bring them up to, to yield standards that might make them more available in the world? Is that the question? Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess it, it's two totally different approaches. One is to try to think of the biotech industry as leading the charge. Obviously, in organic production, we cannot use those crops. Uh, if you did produce them through bioengineering, we could not use them in organic production. So I don't think that uh, those crops didn't end up on the planet through bioengineering. We don't need bioengineering to improve them. Most of the food crops that we have today, except for a handful, were really produced through uh, standard breeding practices. And I think that there's enough work to be done there with using standard breeding practices that we can improve any crop that we really want to. The problem has been in the past, no one has wanted to. Uh, we talk about the, the, the roller crimper that, I, that I've been working with and um, and different crops that we can roll. Well, we can roll barley, for example. And I was out talking with some folks at uh, Washington State University, and there were some barley breeders there. 
And I said, the problem with barley is it is too short. It doesn't produce enough biomass. But it, it, it uh, forms a seed head much earlier than some of the other crops, and it would work really well. And he said, oh, well, we bred it to be short. It used to be seven feet tall and real leafy. The problem was, he said, it lodged. But you want it to fall over anyway. So maybe what we should be doing is looking at a lot of the breeding that took place in the past and trying to see what kind of characteristics we want in plants and go back and capture that and bring that forward. And the same thing could be true with food crops as well. A lot of the food crops that we have were produced specifically to be produced in an environment where chemicals are used or a specific production system. And that may not be the production system that we want. So we as farmers uh, need to challenge ourselves to try to identify what characteristics we want in cover crops, in cash crops. Why can't broccoli be three foot tall and have a head that's different if that's what we wanted. If weed management is, a, is an issue for us, and it is, then we want uh, soybeans that are bushier and leafier. But that's not what guys want when they're trying to produce them with Roundup. They want single stem or real narrow tights so they can put them in the grain drill. We need to think about what it is we want and then challenge seed breeders and, and those kind of folks to produce what we want. And right now, they're not. We're just taking off-the-shelf material and using it, whether it's in food production or cover crop production, the tools that we use, just taking off-the-shelf materials and using those. And I, I don't think it's appropriate. But we need to start asserting ourselves. We're a large enough part of the industry now that we've captured people's attention. We have support of the, of the uh, purchasing community that buys our food products. Uh, I think we can start to sway things in our direction. And we need, but we need to assert ourselves and make sure that that happens. Any other questions? Okay, thank you for your time. <laughs>